right, so we got Steve Stout back on the podcast, one of the few return guests that we have. And Stout, I got to gotta give you credit because when you first launched United Masters, I feel like people weren't even talking about this term creator economy, creator wave, or any of that. And now this is all that we hear about. And I got to imagine that's been an exciting time for you because like a lot of things, you've been ahead of the curve on this and now you can see what it's been like. like what has it been like from your perspective while this broader movement is happening? Thank you for that. Uh, I feel the same way about you. You know, when you started this po podcast uh, and writing about just how hip hop and the, the relationship between hip hop and businesses and um, how well they work together and how hip hop has sort of seen some of these demand and supply curves before um, mainstream America businesses have um, is something that you've, I, I give you a lot of credit for. But for me, um, what's exciting is that finally the artists have an opportunity now, I believe, to realize their dreams and break the chains of being stuck to the infrastructure, legacy infrastructures that's caused so many problems for so many years, in my opinion, um, where artists die broke or artists aren't allowed to do certain things or can't make decisions because um, they don't own the shit. And Massa P spoke about this. Damon Dash spoke about this. But there was so much money in the industry back then, it sounded cool. But when there's so much money, it's hard to move the industry to say, maybe they're not eccentric, maybe they're right. And, you know, it's not my original idea. United Masters is my original idea. United Masters is a, um, a manifestation of ideas that Master P had, Sam Cooke had, Damon Dash had, Jay-Z discussed. Um, Many artists have had these type of, of statements. Um, and, you know, I believe that I was um, early in formulating a system by bringing together uh, the technology to get it done. I mean, you know how much time I've spent in Silicon Valley. The relationships with the artists, because I've earned their trust and belief that I, I understand, you know, what they need. And Having the advertising and creative services company attached to that has also been uh, a tremendous advantage for us. So um, I didn't see it earlier than anybody else, but I certainly believe I was first in putting all of those things together so that there's a scalable solution for independence. That point you made about the money, I think is important, especially now with the opportunity, because I know one of the things you've often talked about is just how fame itself is separating from so many of these things that it used to be aligned with. And I think money is another one yeah. of those, right? You can make your bag and you can make the money that you want without reaching those highest levels of fame. And I think now with all the tools that are there, the music industry allows you to do that. So it's really kind of this thing, at least in my eyes, if you're siding with a major if you want something different. There's something that may not be financially related or something that you may want that's different than that. And I think that's one of the things that stuck out to me in some type of ways. Obviously, they're still correlated, but there is a little bit of a, a difference there. And the question? Well, I mean, I'm saying it less so much as like a question, but more just as a statement, as a follow up to what you're saying, because I think that from the money perspective, you can now have the ability to do everything you want, whether it is putting out your music, growing your following, growing your audience, and you can do that. And I think in the past, it was just so much harder to do that. It wasn't impossible, as you mentioned, folks like Sam Cooke or Master P have been doing that. So I think what you've highlighted is more so, yeah, the technology and the speed that we have now makes it easier to do this. So I guess with that and thinking from your perspective, at least from my view, yeah, I got I, it. okay. So fundamentally, the biggest shift has been the record companies own distribution. And by default, what that means is you have to go through a record company in order to find an audience. You need a record company 
to then find who are the people who love, like, or have an opinion of you at scale. They controlled MTV. They controlled radio. They controlled the outlets that amplified that opportunity for your music to shine, to get heard. And they no longer have that control. Now, an artist finds an audience before they find a record company. A writer, a writer, uh, that's what Substack is about. A writer finds an audience before they find a, a, a publication to publish it. These shifts are what has driven the creator economy, where now all I need is the tools to amplify. I may need a micro loan. I may need um, a promotion, but I certainly don't need to give up my intellectual property in exchange for your access to an audience. Those days are gone. And that's been the biggest shift. And whoever's not aligned to that shift is going to get run over by it. Um, record companies will always be good for the most part because at the end of the day, they could be owners of the catalog that they essentially took because technology wasn't there for many artists at that time. So a lot of artists, thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, have sign their rights away early to record companies and they may never get them back or will never get them back. You know, for every Anita Baker great story, there's, you know, thousands of stories of guys who've tried and failed. And to get it back when you're at your peak, when you can promote it and you have the wisdom and the energy to do it is almost non-existent. So they'll be sitting on that catalog and mining it and, you know, that's what they did. And they'll always be remembered on the, on the other side of right when, when history recalls this. And then you'll see this new generation, this art, this generation that Prince would be so proud of if he was alive to watch it today, that he certainly spearheaded, where you don't need them. They need you. And you should own your rights and be able to transfer it to your family and your family's family. It should be an heirloom. The rights, the IP, the authors of these songs, the authors of these stories, it should be something that they should carry with them forever. And if they decide to sell it to a publishing company or whatever down the line for you know, a high multiple, that is a much more beneficial outcome than selling it early in your career for peanuts and then allowing them to rent your rights back to you. Right. And with that, do you think that there is a ceiling in terms of how high an artist that wants to own their IP, own their intellectual property, own all of their assets can go? Like if that artist wants to perform at the Super Bowl or be a pop star on that level, what are your thoughts on that? That, uh, that no, I don't think the ceiling. I think the ceiling keeps getting removed. Like Toby Nigui, um is in the Beyonce uh, uh, campaign for her Adidas line, and that's promotion for her him like everywhere around the world. Snow Allegra is. She she owns their rights, right? Again, going through getting that promotion and an endorsement from a, a global superstar like Beyonce. The more and more things like that happen, the more exposure these artists get, it's just a moment in time before they get the Super Bowl. It don't even and by the way, Jay-Z's picking the artists for the Super Bowl now. The whole thing is changing, right? So 10 years ago, when Forget 10 years ago, five years ago, he was writing raps, shitting on Roger Goodell. Five years later, he's picking the Super Bowl acts. Independent artists won't even be known as independent artists anymore. They're just going to be a song and an artist that you love. 
you're not going to care what label they're on. Nobody cares what label anybody's on anyway. Those days are over. It. I have a 16 year old daughter. She doesn't like the uh, uh, young thug because he's on 300. She doesn't like. She doesn't care. She doesn't even know. It's not like when I was growing up. When oh, you on Death Jam? You on Bad Boy? You on Death Row? Oh, you're signed to this. You're signed that. That was almost the label was the endorsement. The label doesn't have that power anymore. In fact, the label is nothing more than a service provider, a bank loan, so to speak. That is the most expensive bank loan that has ever been provided. <laughs> what are your thoughts on some of the labels like like a QC, for instance? Because I feel like there's something a little different about, you know, what they've been able to do for folks listening for an equality control music. There's things that are a little different from what they've been able to do as opposed to some of the more legacy labels that we may have grown up with. Um, I think QC and um, there are other there, there are production companies that are finding artists early and providing value to that artist in an early stage of their career. My issue is if there is an issue, and I'm not pointing to QC directly, is that production companies can't just be the tool that the labels use to then get those same rights. So it's like, you know, back in the days, the gangsters, the 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 the, uh, the mafia couldn't sell drugs in Harlem. So what they did was they enlisted black street guys to then poison the people in Harlem with the drugs. And the black street guys were cool with it as long as they got 50% of the profits. Like, you don't want to be on that side of history either. You want to be able, if you're going to find the acts early and you're going to um, uh, provide these acts a career, then y'all both should go into the label and both should take advantage of the fact that they can't do it without you guys. So I think the artist should absolutely still retain their rights, even in those production deals. Um, the production companies are valuable. So as long as the production companies aren't extended arms of the labels to do their dirty work. Mm. I hear you on that. I hear you on that. And yeah, and I think part of this too that resonates, you recently had a conversation with Russ, who many people listening know is one of the more vocal and successful independent hip hop artists that we've seen. And I think it's one of these things because he brought up this point about how if you're signing to a label, if you're going that route, you're more likely to want to do some of the things that are associated with either the machine or the fame, right? So you're getting nominated and performing and winning Grammy Awards or some of these award shows, right? You're getting some of these major yeah. festival headlines and stuff like that. And I have to imagine that even over time, that piece of it will also start to shift no different than the Super Bowl example that you had mentioned. We may not necessarily see it now, at least at this particular moment, but I, I do think that just given the way things are going, that will start to shift. And I assume you probably agree with that sentiment too, just given what you've seen. That's a lower barrier of the shift. I mean, yeah, of course that's going to shift. That, look, these independent artists are going to have their own festivals. The whole, the walls are coming down, uh, Dan. You know, there's a, uh, there's, a, there's a line, change will never be this fast and it will never be this slow again. That's how fast these things are shifting. Mm -hmm. And there's nothing more you can do about it but get with it and build as an entrepreneur build into that speed as quick as we're talking about, Hey, be independent. Now you're talking about NFTs. Now you're talking about blockchain. Now you're talking about crypto. I'm looking at Tory Lanez and let's put any of the Megan Stallion shit aside or whatever the court case is. I'm not interested in talking about that. I know nothing about that. What I do know is that, Tory is now an independent artist. Tory's running around happy and laughing and selling NFTs. Corey's release, Tory's releasing music quickly. 
Tori clearly has creative control. If I'm an artist signed to a label, and this man's walking around saying I made $3 million in three minutes or whatever he's doing, how do you think that artist must feel? They don't own their music to sell it as an NFT. They can't even participate in certain values that technology continues to unlock. The one thing I know that history has told us is that whether it's the vinyl to the to the eight track, the eight track to the cassette, the cassette to the CD, CD to streaming, that re- technology has always changed and shifted a format that has benefited the rights holder, either in volume of sales, access to more people, accessibility. The owner of the IP has benefited from technical advances. And now you have NFTs. Now you have contracts in the blockchains. Now you have crypto payments. If you are not that rights holder, those conversations aren't even for you. How do you feel being stuck in a label because they give you a million dollars to force one song and now that's going to determine the fact that you can't participate in all of this unlocked value that technology is providing. The second key here is artists don't need, it's good to have a manager. Artists need chief technology officers. They don't need a, a, a guy managing them, telling them, no, NFTs are fake. It's not real. I'll look into it. No, you need a tech platform right by your side, helping you extract all the value that's being created daily. That's what you need. And the information to help make that decision. Now, I'm not saying get rid of managers at all. I'm saying that the chief technology or the platform is more important than the manager right now because the chief, because the platforms and technology is changing it so quickly that if you're not on it, you will miss the boat and miss out on that value. That is a statement that I'm making. Let's talk a little bit more about this technology piece and the platform piece, because I think you brought up NFTs and token and crypto. And I think all of that is this movement that we're at now. And even the example you brought up with Tory Lanez is a testament to that. And I know to date, United Masters, at least when things started, you were primarily focused on the music distribution aspect as it looks to streaming. I'm curious for you as, you know, you're also running a business where you're needing to pay attention and change things as well. What is United Masters partnership and relationship, or I guess facilitation of NFTs and crypto and things on the blockchain? What does that look like? Oh, it's going to be, it's going to be marvelous. And I'm going to get, I mean, it's going to be marvelous and there's going to be, you know, announcements and partnerships and, and, and activity before the end of the year. Our responsibility, we have the privilege and responsibility at United Masters by having a best-in-class, world-class technical team and the services that we provide that we will continue to move the needle in technology to help all of the artists on our platform uh, continue to prosper and partake in the advances in technology on their behalf. We have big announcements coming out around NFTs and uh, the blockchain, smart contracts. You know, we made some statements earlier uh, in the last couple months around um, about split payments. We were late on split payments, I admit that. Uh, but now we also have real time payments, uh, which I'm glad we're doing now. But advancing all of the capabilities in order to stay as flexible um, as needed to make sure our artists are getting a frictionless experience to keep creating what they do well, which is make music, make art, and and make the world a better place. That's that's how I look at it. So um, we're going to continue to do that, and that's our responsibility. So everything that you talked about and things yet to come that we're all still waiting for will find that over time, we will stay in front of that to make sure that artists on United Masses have the tech edge. That's our job. Mm. And I feel like the partnerships piece has been key for you overall, because especially the ones with Twitch and TikTok stuck out. And it's a few things. One, 
it's you giving your artists an opportunity to have a bigger platform with everything that they're doing and you're tapping into all of the things that they themselves need to be doing within their ecosystem so i think it does make it easier for them and i'm curious how do you evaluate and prioritize all those because i'm sure there are a number of them that come you mentioned that you know you felt like you all were a little bit late on split payments but it's not like you're not making other deals at the time. I feel like every few months, there's a new type of partnership that comes through. How do you determine? How do you prioritize everything? Because I'm sure there's just so much that you could dive into at the same time. You're right. And thank you for saying that for me. I couldn't say that. While we were working on, you know, uh, moving technology forward in other areas, um, there may be the things that we've missed, but we certainly haven't missed the mission which is to provide the ultimate value to our artists uh, and the platform and move the industry forward. We have the TikTok partnership has been great. The NBA partnership has been fantastic. Um, ESPN, again, another great partnership. Twitch has been amazing partners with SelectCon um, and other uh, ideas that we are coming out with. Um, Again, announcements and not just announcements, but action. <laughs> Later this year, I feel like a lot of people have announcements and then it just dis they get announcements. Just, you know, announcements are becoming a meme. But we've developed great partnerships. And uh, there's a woman I brought on the executive team, Sally Shen. She heads up all of our partnerships. So she works directly with the TikTok team and the Twitch team. And now, you know, the biggest one of all, not no disrespect to all of our great partnerships, but but Apple, they invested in our company and we have a great partnership. And not only do we, we work well with Apple on the United Masters side, but we're also um, the creative energy behind Beats by Dre. So we're working with Apple from a partnership perspective on the creative side and on the technical side. So like these partnerships I think are very, very important. And by the way, I think the Apple partnership said that let's not look at independent music anymore as a cottage industry. We're behind it. We believe in this much more than just something that will result in five people living in a minivan trying to go on a tour to hustle some money. This could be a lucrative business that will be an alternative to signing to a label um, that over time could be just as lucrative, if not more. And of course, own your shit. Can you talk a little bit more about the Apple partnership? Because I remember when the news came out, $50 million, which is great and impressive in a lot of ways. And it sounds like it's been something that can continue to change the game for you all. What are some of the things that you'll be focusing or what are some of the things that you'll be able to do differently now specifically because of Apple? I know we talked about a number of things, but is there anything specific that's been tied to that funding? No, I mean, the funding is to keep doing what we're doing. I mean, we, we've, we've, you know, it hasn't been like, it's not a situation where we, uh, um, you know, they're not altering or asked us to do anything different than we have been doing. Um, it's about, it's about doing more of what we do, to be honest with you. And, um, and because of the partnership, I think it partnerships create the opportunity for better relationships because you, you speak more often and better relationships leads to more opportunities because people like doing business with people they like doing business with. Um, so the, the partnership leads to that kind of uh, symbiotic synergy. But as it relates to a change of course or anything like that, no. Um, this was, we like what you're doing. Here goes some fuel to do more what you're doing at scale. So as we start to roll out our ambitions to go global, which we will, having a partnership like that is very helpful. Um, you know, Apple means the same thing in South America as it means in India, as it means in China and Japan and Africa, and everybody who's in those markets who have had got their chance to go over there early and build their little business, um, they should hear our footsteps because we're coming. Mm. 
And is there anything differently that you're doing in some of these different countries as you're growing internationally? Because at least from like what I've seen, more so from a customer acquisition perspective, United Masters has done a good job of marketing its artists and then therefore establishing a brand for itself that then attracts new artists. And I'm sure roughly speaking, that is the global strategy as well. But what are some of those unique differences that may be there for, let's say, artists in Africa or artists in you know, Latin America, as opposed to some of the artists that you've been able to attract to date that have been in the U.S.? Well, I don't want to I can't get into all of that right now. Uh, Dan, as much as I like you and I like reading all of your blogs and you listen to your podcast, you know, I'm tempted to give up, you know, some of the family secrets. But I, I, I <laughs> um, what, the one thing I realize in this industry is that most people have no ideas. And because they have no ideas, um, when I say something, they tend to like copy it. So I've started to say less. <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. But I, but I, I'm, my my bigger point is that we are going international, and um, the point. Look, I look at most of these companies in general, and I knew this from the time I started United Masters that anyone that was doing it, we weren't first. There were other companies that were doing it, but they they were and are utilities, like. Con Edison in, in New York is a, is a utility. They, they're, they, the lights, PSC and G, right? They're the lighting companies, they're utilities. You know, you use it as a service. I always wanted to build, what if Def Jam, the music company, had been an advertising agency? How great would that have been? The artwork, the storytelling. If Interscope, would have been an advertising agency. How great would that have been? The artists, the cultural edge, and everything that they stood for. When I built Translation, our marketing services company, which is our sister company to United Masters, it's 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 pretty much recognized around the world that we're the best creative agency out there that understands culture by a long shot. There's nothing to talk about. There's, it's, we win every... It, that's nothing to discuss. I wanted to build the music company, the independent music company that had the vibe and the energy that Def Jam and Interscope had in its heyday. That's the ambition. So that the creative that we put out on the advertising side, the marketing side, and then what the brand United Masters stands for, owning your rights, the freedom, and being irrational about that. It's like, like this is where we stand, period. Either you're with us or you're not with us. Either with, with Interscope, you don't have Snoop Dogg, Dr. Dre, Eminem, Marilyn Manson, Limp Bizkit, uh, No Doubt. These artists are all in that place because they went to a place that said, we fuck with artists that are moving the culture. We fuck with artists that are on the cultural edge. Def Jam, I can name the roster, the same thing. It's the same ambition. And they were irrational about ever homogenizing that belief because of a wider business opportunity. That's us. I'm taking that same, and I've been around Russell Simmons and around Jimmy Ivey and the guys who built those companies, and I know exactly what it takes. You can't fuck around and get caught up in what everybody else is doing and then all of a sudden start moving your philosophy, because the mainstream, there's, there's, there's success coming from anywhere else. You may, like, that's not what we're doing. So the combination of creative that pushes the cultural edge and building a music distribution company that has all the services, that makes it frictionless for the artists, that gives them the opportunity to grow and prosper and be small businesses and own their shit, and know that they have a partner behind them that support that, that's the company I'm building. So go ahead. If that's a secret, then somebody should copy it. See, that's what I was going to ask you, because I think that the execution of so many of these things is real. And in many ways, that's the more valuable part. And I think that's the harder part to copy. And of course, I think that there are other 
co- calling them competitors may be a strong word because I don't think there's anyone doing exactly what you're doing, but other music distributors that may hear some of these insights, but even if they heard it, I don't necessarily think that they could execute it the same way because it isn't necessarily on brand. At least that's kind of been my impression of things. A lot of these guys, or whatever, they want to really be major labels. They want to be, you know, the fifth major or... I have no desire in any of that. Um, I think brands and artists have a lot in common. Brands want to buy into cultural currency. Artists create cultural currency. We are the marketplace that facilitates that. Right. Yeah. And I think, I think for you all, like one of the one of the things that did stick out to me, you know, we're talking about different opportunities here, is what would it look like for United Masters specifically to get involved or support artists directly on the direct one-to-one communication aspects with fans? We had talked about Substack before, and I think in a lot of ways, you and Substack do have similar type of business models, at least in terms of the fees that you may charge people and then what they may earn on top of that from a revenue perspective. But I'm pers- pers- just to full, full disclosure, I'm an investor in Substack. I believe in everything that they're doing. And um, the fact that we're both funded by Andreessen Horowitz, so both investors in our company, um, there's a lot of intelligence that you get from having those kind of, that kind of access. Again, partnerships, access, people do business with who they want to do business with. Rinse and repeat. Mm. And with that, I would expect to see, you know, what like anyone that is at certain level, I'm sure they all have email lists, but it's like, boom, if you are a United Masters artist, let's get you set up on Substack. You get your email address, you can collect your direct fan communication, or even, you know, what I don't, I don't think Andreessen Orwis is invested in any of the text marketing platforms. I might be wrong, but what that could look like, right? Like I was curious about like that piece of it, because I think the marketing piece is great, but I'm. I was always curious about that too. The, the, the text marketing, I, I love the idea. I think that, you know, there was super phone and then community. Um, I mean, and they both, you know, use Twilio as a backend, you know. What I'm trying to sort out there, text is clearly the better, more personable communication tool. It has to start to feel way more personalized than it does right now. It still feels spammy. Um, I think that is the future. Mm -hmm. I think those companies are in the right place, definitely. But I think it feels spammy. So I don't feel like the person I subscribe to is really talking to me. Like, it may say, hey, Steve. But then it turns into like something that then turns spammy. Mm-hmm. I hear that, and, and people and people feel that. Right? Yeah. Um, but it doesn't mean it's wrong. It just means that they, you know you got to get that part right. And that's what makes me think this is the early days of it, right? Because I hear you on the spammy part. I think it can be very much just like they may use your name, but it's is like is that a word spammy? Spammy is that like, <laughs> is it? <laughs> The, the act of spam. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, it's the verb. Right, yeah. It's spammy. Yeah, I don't know if it is a word, but, but it should definitely be one. But I, I hear you on that, though, because I signed up for a few of them, and it would be like, yeah, they may say your name, but it's like, oh, here's this discount code to go sign up for this. And it's like, all right, this isn't a relationship. You're just trying to get me to buy yeah. something. And yeah. I know that, yeah, it might be tough at scale. I know that Ryan Leslie has some good case studies from like what he's done at Superphone. But yeah, I'm curious to see what that looks like, because I'm sure with some of your artists obviously just see what they've been able to do on Instagram, for instance. Yeah. The opportunities there. And I think maybe we just need a few case studies that are been the same case studies that we've seen so far from this movement. I don't know. No, we have a long way to go. I mean, one-to-one communication is clearly the one thing I knew early in this is that artists needed CRM tools. Um, You need the advantage when everything went digital. I don't care what aspect of e-commerce where you sit at. Let's go back 10 years ago before at the beginning of e-commerce blowing up. I could sell you something in one store for $10. 
And there'd be another store five miles away that sold that same item for $750. But you having knowledge of that item at $750 was very difficult to find out. Maybe somebody told you. And then you had to drive that far to go get it when you can get it right here for $10. And that was a marketplace advantage that retail had, that comparable pricing was hard. When e-commerce came in, comparable pricing became so easy for the customer that they were, they were um, uh, uh, sites that basically took all the information and get, found the best price for you. And then it just over time became no one could fuck you on price, right? It'd be very hard to get fucked on price. Okay. The um, brands have figured out, well, you know what? If we're going to sell it at a lower price, at a lower margin, that's fine. But we're going to collect the information of who bought it so that when we sell it the second and the third time, we don't have any marketing costs. So, yeah, we make less, less money per sale, but we make more margin over time because it becomes easier to sell the second and the third one. You don't have any marketing costs associated with it. Artists should have that same privilege. You bought my first single. You bought my first project. How come I don't know who you are to sell me your second project, the third project, or sell you my merch, or sell you my ticket, or sell you my NFT, ba 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 ba. The record companies did not build any engineering ecosystem to solve that problem, nor is it in their best interest to do that. Because if the artists know who their fans are, they definitely won't need a record company. The independents, it is our responsibility to build CRM tools over time. I want community to win. I want Superphone to win. I want anything that allows us to plug in to a service that allows, if you listen to this, you probably are going to buy this, this, and this. Oh, and here comes the second single or the second project because we know you're the super fan. That's the missing piece. And either it's going to get done through them or get done through us or someone like us. Hopefully it's us because one-to-one -one communication is a critical tool that's missing. And it's CRM tool. It's a, you know, it's a technical term that, you know, brands use, but it's basically customer service management. I agree. I think that's a good point. Yeah. And I'm... Um... Curious, from what you've seen, what is the best solution that some of the more successful independent artists are using right now? Like, do they build their own thing through Salesforce, or what have you seen? Uh, the, 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 the best people at doing it, I re realize, are the girls who are, or guys, who have decided to use their talents um, stripping showing their body, they've gone to, they've gone to only fans and have allowed that level one step deeper. I mean, using TikTok and Instagram allows you the opportunity to get scale. But then you can go to only fans and get monetized super fans. The gaming business has done it to its credit incredibly well. In fact, there's a blog post that Chris Dixon put out about the gaming business and the music business. I can share it with you and send it to you if you don't have it. And why two things that are very similar have gr grossly different outcomes because of the way they handle customers. But strippers, dancers, adult performers have used Instagram for the mass tool and then have had a place like OnlyFans for that direct one-on-one -on -one engagement to monetize super fans. There is no version of that for music. So if you're a musician, I mean, nobody, you're not only only fans don't care about you singing a song, and it's cool. But you are seeing the growth in Twitch. You've seen the Twitch Rockonomics uh page. Yep. If you have okay, so you are seeing it happening at Twitch, but there's more supply and demand than there's enough surfaces to cover. 
where you can monetize one on one um, with your super fans. And this is, but this will be all sorted out very shortly. I believe. Yeah, that. I do too. And I think that's a good point about the OnlyFans. I think what the platform enables is you have your monthly subscriptions. And with that, you can track all the things like LTV or churn rate or, you know, specific data on that person. And that's really what we're talking about underlyingly. And I do think that if you're an artist, yeah, especially if you're an artist on Twitch, some of the people that are doing well, yeah, I think Will Page had mentioned this in that Rocknomics report. The people that are pay you religiously, you have that data by, you know, definition through the CRM platform. The thing is with music, mm -hmm. just because I think with so many of the artists, they're not necessarily selling subscription services. Most of the time it's these one-time purchases. Like you're buying that album once, you're going to that concert once. And I do think the solution is there to be able to have the platform that can have both the member data if you have some type of monthly subscription but also has the data from these one-time purchases too i don't think we're far away from that but i agree with you that we just haven't got that piece of it yet so it's going to be fascinating yeah. to see well, it's going to be fascinating to see and you know i'll be there um i'll be there it's exciting um all of this is exciting we we're going through a um a period in time and where we're seeing either, you know, the, the, this renaissance around music and what it means and, 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 and the way financial markets are looking at music. Um, and years of a drought are behind us. Uh, we are now looking at a upward sort of tick in, in, in music and the meaning of it and the impact of it. Um, and my job and our job is to create these artists the opportunity, as I told Russ, we're small businesses. Artists have to be small businesses. And small businesses need all the tools to compete. Um, they can't be looked at as assets of a bigger business. They have to be small businesses that are run by independent leaders that are driving their outcome. Um, and uh, that's what United Masters, and that's what I built the platform for. So hopefully the next time when we check in, I'm sure, because um, I, I, I love what you're doing and proud of you and what you're building. No problem being a second or third time return guest because, you know, you definitely understand the business and you are respectful of it um, and understand everything that I'm saying. And, um, you know, hopefully the next time we have this conversation, we could pick up on where... We are with NFTs and blockchain and where, what advances have we made in CRM tools and in the industry itself. And we should keep that conversation going and then to the next one, because that's how we hold each other accountable for growth. I agree. And I think even going back, listening to the conversation we had, I think you were one of the last in-person guests I'd had before everything broke out with the pandemic. And you're right. It's been that evolution of conversation. I don't really think we were talking about NFTs or anything related to Web3 at that point. No. You know, it wasn't even in the mind at that point. No, sir. Yeah. So, no, this is good stuff. Stout, this has always been a pleasure, man. Thank you, man. Before we let you go, Thank man. You. Anything else you want to plug? I know you gave a bunch, but anything else you want to plug or let the audience know about? No, I have nothing to plug, man. Just keep tuning in the Trapital to get your motherfucking mind right. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you, man. I appreciate you.